Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with today's webinar. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is Melissa from the National Ocean Sciences Bowl National Office in Washington, D.C. Um, again, thanks for joining us. I'm just going to start with a real quick introduction of NOSB because I think we have a few people who are joining us who um, may not participate in our competition. Uh, so the NOSB is an academic competition for high school students across the United States and they get tested in their knowledge of all things related to the ocean and ocean sciences. And each year, at least for the past few years, we've had a theme for the competition year. This year happens to be the science of oil in the ocean. So our webinar series here is particularly for our coaches. It's something where they can get some background on new and upcoming research and science and be able to um, learn more about the ocean sciences if they're interested, but also incorporate what they learn into their teaching, either in their classroom or with their study sessions with their teams. But as you all know, we do open this up to any educator who's interested in learning about the topic. Um, and just so you know, today's webinar, uh, the webinar from last week and our one that we will have next week, we do record them all. So. If, for, if you know someone who miss, is missing today's webinar, uh, we will have the recordings up on our website. If you go to our homepage at www.nosb.org, right on our front page is a link to our professional development webinar series information, and you'll find anything you need about the series there. So for today, our agenda is that we'll have a one-hour presentation, and then we'll have 30 minutes for you to do questions and answers. Just so you're reminded, you are all currently on mute. This just helps with the presenter so that there's no uh, background noises. Um, everyone can hear him. This chat box at the very bottom of your screen, that's where you're going to want to type in all your questions that you have today. At the very end of the presentation, I will read the questions aloud to our presenter. So you feel free to type them in now or as they pop up during the webinar, or you can wait till the very end. Also, you know, feel free to provide feedback. Um, either in that chat box or uh, email at us at nosb at oceanleadership.org. Uh, we love to get feedback on how you use these webinars and how they help you and your students prepare for the competitions or just in general. That helps us retain funding um, to be able to offer this series. Also, our presenter today has said that he would be willing to answer any questions that you might have offline. So again, feel free to email us. Um, and we will get those to our presenters so we can answer them for you. So our guest expert for today is Dr. Arthur Mariano, and he's at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And today he's going to be presenting on ocean currents and the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil blowout. So our first webinar was sort of about the chemical composition of oil. Today is going to be more about uh, the transport and tracking of oil. Um, just to give you a hint, you should be, if you have a few different tabs open on the Web WebEx uh, screen, make sure that you clicked on the one that says Arthur Mariano's screen. That's the one that's currently going to um, be showing the presentation. Um, one other tip, currently you probably see the video screen, the participant screen, and the chat screen. If you don't want to see those, there's little X's up in the right-hand corner. You can close them for now. And then you can also use the two arrows um, to make the actual presentation full screen. So just in case you need a little help with that. Um, again, feel free to type into the chat box if you're having any problems or any questions. Um, otherwise, we are going to get started with Arthur. Arthur, go ahead. You are now on. Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. And uh, a big thanks for uh, all you do as uh, uh, teachers. I'm a member of the CARTH uh, Consortium, and the work I'm going to be talking about has been funded by the Gulf of Mexico Research uh, Initiative. Uh, shown right now is a visible image of the oil spill uh, uh, during its first phase. Uh, we're going to go through the various stages of the oil spill and how the ocean currents uh, affect the uh, transport and dispersion of oil. Okay, first of all, whenever I give a public talk, I like to tell uh, folks that science is just the best guess. Some guesses, of course, are better than others. And predicting where oil goes and its effects is, is harder than rocket science. And that's one of the messages I want to convey uh, to you. This is not an easy uh, science to do. 
Um, before we get into the oil, let me mention something about the surface of the ocean, what moves things around. As you all know, in March of 2011, there was a major tsunami off the coast of Japan. The first object that went across the Pacific Ocean was a soccer ball, and there's a very uh, nice story about they found the soccer ball and they actually returned it uh, to the owner. And the reason that soccer ball made it across the ocean before anything else is the fact that the winds are very strong and push that ball uh, that's riding on the surface of the ocean. Uh, when you look at what moves stuff on the ocean surface, it's a combination of wind, waves, and ocean currents. And of course, more closer to the surface, the ocean currents become important. And when you have objects sticking out uh, of the surface, uh, for example, bobbing up and down like a lost boat, the winds become uh, very critical in predicting where things move. Uh, shown here are two scenes that are out in the Pacific Ocean right now. These are objects from the tsunami that have ended up in convergence zones. It's a fact that when you look at less dense objects, objects that are less dense than seawater, for example, plastics, sargassum weed, uh, drifters, they will end up in surface convergence zones. Due to the flow of the ocean, due to the ocean dynamics, there are places where ocean water comes together and converges. Now the ocean water, the seawater, can feel the three-dimensional effects and move downward in the water column in these convergence zones. These objects, including oil, uh, are less dense, so they cannot feel the vertical uh, movement, so they get uh, uh, very highly concentrated in this convergence zone, which has uh, a very uh, dire consequences about oil spills, is that in places the oil concentrations can be very great due to these convergence, and we'll see that. So here's the first the visible image of the deep water horizon oil blowout uh, a few days after it happened. Uh, what you can see here uh, is the Mississippi Delta, the northern Gulf of Mexico, and just south southeast of the tip of the Mississippi Delta, we see an anomalous blob of, on the ocean surface, and that's the oil uh, that's coming up there. And the first thing you notice uh, that it's fairly concentrated and that there's some filaments, long, thin uh, concentrations of oil coming out of the main blob. Uh, here's an aerial uh, photograph of what was happening at the edge of where the oil was protruding into the uh, cleaner water. So this is an example of a front this front is being caused by density differences between the oil-water mixture versus just pure uh, water. The, the dynamics along the front are very complicated. One of the things you notice in this picture is there's a lot of small-scale wiggles in the distribution of the front. And we have found uh, by looking very closely at the circulation and the dynamics of the Gulf of Mexico that these small-scale processes are very important for determining where oil goes in the ocean. Uh, now as we get closer to the surface, here's an image uh, from a boat showing how sharp that front can be. Anybody that spends any time fishing uh, in the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico uh, goes out looking for these fronts uh, where different water masses uh, come together because it's a place where there are convergences and uh, we get bait fish uh, converging in those fronts and the large pelagics follow. Now we get even a closer view of the oil. Um, the one thing you should take home from this picture is that the oil distribution is patchy. That if you look closely in on the oil, there's places where the oil concentration is very great and it's very thick. And just 10, 15 centimeters away from this very large, strong concentration of oil, you have places where the water has very little oil on its surface. So oil um, concentrations vary by many orders of magnitudes due to ocean uh, dynamics and the velocity distribution. Even getting further uh, magnified, a very close look at the oil. Uh, this actually looks uh, pretty, even though it's uh, oil floating on the uh, surface. And we can see the, the much different colors of the oil. And again, on very small scales, scales of less than an inch, the concentrations of the oil can vary by three to four orders of magnitude. Uh, now this becomes important when the oil starts reaching the land. So here in this uh, picture, showing the oil uh, reaching uh, some of the marshes areas in the northern Gulf of Mexico, one thing uh, you notice in this picture uh, to the left of the landmass is that most of that area is, uh, the, most of the water is oil free. On the other hand, there are places where the oil is highly concentrated. 
And the fact that it's highly concentrated means it will have more toxic effect on marine uh, life. Uh, getting even a, a nice shot looking into the marshes, uh, one of the things you notice in the center part of the picture is that even in the marshes, there's pools of places where the oil concentration is fairly low, and then there are other pools where the oil concentration is uh, uh, much greater. Now, besides hitting the marshes, uh, we all know the oil uh, came onto the beach, shown here as a wave uh, breaking onto the beach, uh, bringing oil onto the beach. Um, one of the, uh, the uh, besides just oil coming on to the beach, uh, one of the things we normally find on the beach after an oil spill is tar ball, or tar balls. Uh, tar balls are left behind products. It's when all of the lighter uh, gases have escaped the oil, heavier parts of the oil has sunk. It leaves these uh, patties behind. For scales, you can see the size of these. They have a tendency to be a few inches uh, in size, and depending on the spill, they could be m many different colors. Now, during the uh, oil spill, I actually found a couple dozen oil patties on the coast of uh, Hollywood, Florida. I brought them to the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, thinking maybe uh, oil did get around uh, into the Straits of Florida and, and, and reached uh, Hollywood. Uh, but it turned out that my samples and about 200 other samples between Key West and Forest Pierce showed that those tar balls were from oil uh, that was not the Deepwater Horizon blowout and probably came from ships that were taking advantage of uh, being able to unload their bilges in the middle of the uh, spills. Okay, so there's a lot of processes that influence the distribution of oil from a blowout. So at a depth of 1,500 meters, there was an engin uh, engineering accident that allowed uh, a very large mixture of oil and gases to escape the seafloor. The oil and gases are much less dense than seawater, so since they're less dense than seawater, uh, that density difference will drive a buoyant flow from the deep ocean up to the surface. Now, this flow is being driven by density differences. Those density differences are large, so the flow velocities are large. This creates a velocity shear, places where the velocity are large, and then away from the central part of the blowout, the velocities are much weaker. This velocity shear helps enhance the turbulent mixing of the oil and gas mixture, and we're going to show you a, a numerical simulation of how that happens in a few moments. Um, as this oil and water mixture comes out, some of the heavier part of the mixture sinks immediately uh, to the ocean floor. So in the vicinity of the wellhead, of course, you have the greatest concentrations of the oil, and, that con and the concentrations of the oil will decrease as you go away from the blowout. Now, also, as part of the mixing process, as we'll see in the animation, the oil mixes with the seawater and forms subsurface plumes. These subsurface plumes are then spread by deep ocean currents, uh, deep ocean eddy activities, mostly along uh, the topography. So we expect to see a lot of the uh, oil uh, in the depth ranges of on the order of 1,500 meters where the spill came out. So then the oil reaches the surface. And on the surface, the ocean currents are stronger. The ocean eddies, which is a type of ocean variability that looks like small hur hurricanes in the ocean, but they're much, much slower. The thermodynamics are much different, but they consist of significant rotary motion. The mean ocean currents and these eddies help transport the oil away from uh, its initial location. Winds also push the oil. Waves also uh, push the oil. And as the oil is on the surface, the oil starts to weather. Uh, sun, light, uh, and especially in warmer temperatures the, and under good wind conditions, the oil will start evaporating. The benzenes, the lighter uh, gaseous elements leave the oil, usually within the first 24 hours or so, leaving behind a, a product that's a little bit heavier. As the oil spreads out and mixes with the water, some of the heavier parts fall down. And so even away from the uh, wellhead, you will have oil going into the uh, water column uh, from the surface. And as the uh, oil um, gets closer to the coast, a completely different set of coastal dynamics uh, take over. And we're going to describe a, a number of, uh, of these processes in detail in the next uh, half hour. And if you want to learn about each of the numerical modeling activities, the experiments, and about these processes in more detail, you can visit the CARP website. Now, here's a uh, diagram schematic put, put out by Exxon 1985. 
I'll be honest, um, it's not correct. Uh, there's some problems with it, but this shows the different processes affecting the oil distribution and the time scale. So on the bottom axis is the time scales where they believe these processes are important. The thickness, uh, the amount of black associated with each of the processes is that it's either stronger or weaker. So in the first week or so, there's a lot of spreading and advection of the oil by ocean currents. And to be honest with you, the second uh, thing that Exxon has here, uh, advection, uh, is really wrong because it really depends on the ocean velocity conditions and where the oil uh, goes uh, after it hits the uh, surface. So that advection line uh, should be uh, much thicker in different places. Uh, in the first week, a lot of it evaporates, leaving uh, tar balls on the surface. A lot of it gets dissolved into the water column. Uh, there's natural dispersion, and in this case, emulsifiers uh, were added, uh, uh, dispersants to help um, the natural uh, emulsification. The emulsification you can think of as if you take uh, vinegar and oil in a salad dressing bottle, shake it up a little bit, you have the oil and, and vinegar uh, mixing with each other. There's a photooxidation effect uh, where light uh, excites uh, some of the uh, atoms. Uh, on the surface of, of, these, uh, of the oil and uh, produces a, a, a reaction uh, releasing some of the lighter elements. And then eventually the oil reaches the sediments and has shoreline uh, stranding and uh, becomes a major mess to clean up. And a lot of you have heard about the oil-eating uh, bacteria that's out there. Um, it's interesting that Exxon has that effect uh, pretty much uh, becoming small after a year. Uh, most scientists uh, would have the biodegradation effect uh, lasting on time scales of decades, uh, not years, this uh, schematic uh, shows, which is put out by one of the oil companies. Uh, how much oil uh, was spilt? Oh, about 200 million gallons uh, was the estimate. Um, basically, 20 million gallons of the oil was skimmed and burned in real-time recovery operations. 34 uh, million gallons was actually recovered by siphons, and I guess they were able to reuse uh, that oil. 50 million gallons of oil is evaporated in this uh, area. It's uh, happened at a time of the year where uh, this, the uh, temperature is warm and you do have uh, significant winds to aid that evaporation. We believe on the order of 10 million gallons or so of the oil is on the bottom as tar mats. That oil will be there for a while, maybe decades. Uh, the oil eating bacteria uh, will have a all you could eat buffet in the vicinity of the wellhead uh, for a while. Uh, they estimated 40 something million gallons. Uh, became tar balls, reached the beaches, or ended up in the sediments, and that 48 million gallons is totally dissolved in oil droplets in the water. Now, 48 million gallons sounds like uh, a lot, and it is, uh, but realize the volume of the Gulf of Mexico is on the order of 10 quadrillion uh, gallons, and there's a flow in the loop current that uh, between the Gulf of Mexico and the Florida Straits that's on the order of 7 to 8 billion gallons of water per second. Okay, here's a numerical simulation. Uh, we're going to show you what happens uh, when oil and gas comes out of the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so first thing you notice, it shoots up fairly quickly because there's a very large density differences. Um, there's a lot of turbulent mixing. Uh, the oil gets concentrated, and you can see a lot of it is reaching the surface in the simulation. But the most important uh, thing besides the oil reaching uh, the surface is that at depths, we see subsurface plumes forming and spreading out. So the less dense oil mixes with the water till it reaches an equilibrium uh, density, and then the effects of ocean currents and turbulent mixing help spread uh, that oil out. Now, whenever you run a numerical model, uh, you need to make sure it's accurate. And one way to do that is to look at real data. And shown here in the next slide is a subsurface oil plume uh, that was found by a remotely uh, operated vehicle by Keneally and his uh, colleagues right after the spill. And you can see that at a depth of a few hundred meters above the spill, there's a very large uh, concentration of oil. And you can also see there's a couple of other places where the concentration is a little greater at depth. And so we believe that the modeling uh, we're doing of these uh, plumes is in the right direction. Now, what happens when the oil comes to the sea surface? Now, shown here on the surface is a front. Uh, there's a front uh, due uh, in this area due to a number of factors, one due to the wind-driven ocean circulation, uh, other due to the effects of the Mississippi River, and also due to the background uh, mean circulation. Now, in, along this front 
we have a sea of ocean eddies. These ocean eddies are very vigorous. Uh, they have velocities on the order of 20 up to 50 centimeters a second and occasionally more in the deeper Gulf of uh, Mexico. And what we're going to see is what happens when the oil uh, reaches the sea surface. And the main message here is that the sea of eddies are very efficient at spreading the oil, oil out horizontally and also uh, because there are uh, convergences associated uh, with the flow with these eddies, the oil does get concentrated into filaments. So let's see that simulation now. So the oil is getting near the surface. We have a bunch of ocean eddies uh, uh, operating on the oil. And you can see on the right-hand side there's a, a filament uh, coming out uh, of that. And that's due to advection by the uh, eddies. The eddy is wrapping the oil around with its strong rotary velocity. Now we have eddies on the left side uh, of the uh, oil uh, surface uh, also evecting the oil uh, further away um, from its uh, surfacing location. So we can see that the eddies help spread out the uh, oil, and they do this very efficiently, and they help to form uh, filaments. OK, um, one of the things when the uh, oil spill was going on, there were forecasts of the oil location. So shown here in a light blue is the forecast for April 26. And you can see from the color scales for the different dates. And then shown here is the last forecast. I think that's a light orange color uh, on May 1st. And you can see that the, the models are predicting that the oil is going to grow in size. And that has to do a lot by turbulent evection, by the background uh, mean flow, and by the uh, ocean eddies. Also, um, one of the things uh, that was noted here, of course, is that the control of the winds on the oil. So one of the reasons most of the oil at this particular time is going to the north of the initial spill uh, location is because of the uh, direction of the winds. Shown here are another set of forecasts. This is now from May uh, 2nd uh, to uh, May 7th. And you can see that by May 7th, uh, the area is even getting larger. And you can see that the oil is starting to impinge the Mississippi River uh, Delta. Shown here is a visible image of the oil from the part of the uh, spill. And one of the things you can see uh, in this image are the filaments uh, coming off the main oil patch as suggested uh, by our numerical simulations. As a matter of fact, there was a very large filament visible. And shown here are two different images of that. The one on the left is from a synthetic aperture radar, which measures surface roughness. Oil reduces surface roughness. So in areas where there's reduced surface roughness, uh, you could uh, detect the oil. This is a nice instrument. Unfortunately, um, at very low wind speeds, it doesn't work uh, too well because there's not much surface roughness. And so the surface roughness signal is very small. And at very large wind speeds, the oil and water starts mixing efficiently, and it's very hard to tell the two apart in the SARM image. Uh, shown to the right of it is a well-known image you may have seen before that was shown a lot of times during the spill. This is a visible image from the MODIS, Aqua, and Terra uh, satellites. A series of visible images were taken by the, uh, those two satellites. Those uh, satellites are NOAA satellites. Uh, they're used a lot. Uh, for example, they produced a nice um, uh, cloud uh, maps. They show us where the hurricanes are. Uh, we use these. Uh, we use data from these satellites to estimate sea surface temperature, ocean color, and other important ocean parameters. And during the early part of the spill, the visible images were, in, when you have a cloud-free day, was one of the best ways to detect where the oil was going. So in both of these images, independent data sets, we see a very strong filament being uh, torn apart from the main oil blob, and that's due to a large uh, eddy that's in this area, uh, and it's affecting the filament around the edge of the eddy. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, a close-up of the SAR image near the Mississippi Delta showing the unhappy uh, consequences of the oil uh, getting into the uh, uh, marshes. Here's, here's another, another uh, SAR image. Uh, this is getting to a point where they're starting to actually uh, reduce the flow uh, of the oil um, uh, due to the different uh, cap and operation, siphon operations, uh, et cetera. Again, more oil um, in, at the end of July uh, getting into the Mississippi Delta. At the time, I was advising the White House uh, about the uh, oil spill. Obama's uh, science advisors were calling me up. They were pretty diligent, you know, Sunday morning, 7 o'clock, some phone calls. And they asked me what I would do with the oil in the marshes. 
Um, I recommended that they uh, burn the oil in the marshes. It would have some uh, short-term consequences, but the long-term effect would be there would be no there would be a lot less oil there than there is now. And unfortunately, every time we have a major weather event like tropical storms and hurricanes, the oil that's in the delta is getting further pushed up into that ecosystem. There's a very uh, large program now uh, looking at removing what's looking at ways to efficiently remove uh, the oil uh, from uh, this area. I think burning it would be a good idea. Uh, it was basically would have been a political PR nightmare uh, to do that. But you have to keep in uh, realize there are a lot of uh, mature ecosystems around the world, like the New Jersey pine barrens that are controlled by fire. Uh, so the oil reached the beaches. Uh, here's a uh, typical cleanup uh, scene. So a, a, a large amount of uh, folks in hazmat uh, un, uh, uniforms are out there cleaning oil off the beach on very hot days, very dirty work. Uh, so a lot of the beaches now, when you look at the surface, you really don't see oil. However, if you go to many of the northern Gulf beaches and dig down, uh, let's face it, sand's like kitty litter. Uh, the oil seeped uh, down the sand, and in many places there is a significant concentration of oil at one to two foot depths in the sand. Um, I'm going to mention here a few minutes, why did Florida get lucky? Uh, why didn't we get covered in oil like the northern Gulf of Mexico? Basically for two reasons. Uh, one is that the oil weathers and evaporates, so a lot of the oil is uh, removed uh, from the system uh, before it was able to get into the uh, loop current and the Florida current. And also, we had a very lucky dynamical event for us. A loop current formed an eddy, in which I'm going to talk about uh, now. So here's a picture of sea surface temperature that's measured by the MODIS Aqua and Terra satellites I mentioned uh, before, and also with some input from the European uh, satellites. The, the brighter colors are higher temperatures, and that circulation feature you see there is the loop current eddy. Uh, as time goes on, and you, uh, right now we're looking at the end of the beginning of July right now, one thing you can notice is that the Gulf of Mexico becomes uh, very warm and it's very hard to see the loop current. It's very hard to see uh, the uh, ocean eddies and uh, there's a lot of clouds in, in, in this area. So as you reach the summertime, the uh, MODIS Aqua and Terra satellites uh, are weren't as useful for detecting uh, the eddy and the ocean dynamics which are needed to predict where the uh, oil moves. So here's a, a blow up of uh, this particular area, color enhanced by Dr. Mitch Roffer from ROTS, and uh, you can see this is the eddy uh, that's being uh, formed. So normally the loop current uh, connects the, the northern Gulf of Mexico uh, to the Florida current uh, through the Florida Straits, and there would be a direct flow, uh, and you would see warm water that would be directly connected from the northern Gulf into the Florida Straits, but now you can see the eastern edge, the southern edge of the warm water is being formed into this eddy feature, and also notice on the western and northern part of this eddy feature, there's very small um, submesoscale ed eddies that are helping to mix the ocean. And if you look uh, near the Mississippi Delta in this picture, you could also see eddies uh, very close to the Mississippi Delta and a, a signature of an ocean, ocean current with the warm uh, water flowing along the coast. So these loop current eddies, uh, on the average, form every nine to 14 months. We were very lucky that it happened to form at the time of the uh, spill, lucky for us in, in, in Florida, helped keep the oil away. Uh, shown here is a uh, image from 1998 showing a loop current eddy, uh, a, a very beautiful image of it, so that's why I included it. And the other important thing about these loop current eddies is they contain a significant amount of warm water with a strong rotary flow on the order of one to two miles an hour. When hurricanes pass over these loop current eddies and they take the heat out of the surface waters to help fuel the hurricane development, the eddies are able to evict war, warm water because of their speeds into the area, providing more fuel for hurricane development. And for example, Hurricane Katrina, one of the reasons it was a very strong hurricane when it hit the northern Gulf of Mexico was that it went over a loop current eddy and was intensified uh, by it. Okay, I'm gonna start talking about predicting where the oil uh, goes. And first off, I'm gonna show you a very bad prediction. Some of you may have seen this. It made the national news, unfortunately. And it predicted that the oil from the Gulf of Mexico was gonna get entrained into the loop current, entrained into the Florida current, 
and spread along the East Coast and spread in, into the entire Northwest Atlantic. Um, first of all, this didn't happen is because they used average velocity conditions. The process of averaging velocity conditions produce a velocity field that really doesn't look like and is not exactly like the velocity field at any given time uh, because of the peculiarities of trying to average uh, data that changes a lot in space and time. Um, so that was a, a problem with this. They didn't put weathering in, the fact that some of this oil was going to be evaporated away and wouldn't stay uh, as oil through its entire journey through the, floor, through the Gulf Stream uh, system. Uh, the other problem with this picture in terms of, you know, the fact that it made the national media, it's kind of a, a nice picture showing really bright colors, and everybody took this as very large oil concentrations, uh, but these colors actually con uh, um, represent very low concentrations of oil. So now I'm going to talk about why it's hard to predict oil. So what do you need to predict oil? What do scientists uh, need? We need to know the oil type and the amount, the location of the oil. We need to know about ocean currents. We need to know about wind speed and direction. Uh, we need to know about temperature because it affects uh, evaporation. And there's other things we need to know. Um, the thing, one thing we need to know is that the winds and the waves have a tendency to push the oil at 3% of the wind speed. And so for a 20-knot wind, that's on the, a little over a half a knot, which is on the same size, is the same speed as the ocean currents. So the winds and the waves are as important as the ocean currents, and also the winds are very important for determining the ocean currents in this area. And then, of course, we need theories of how nature works. We need to, you know, put on a science hat and come up with our best guesses on how nature works. And based on these theories, we will build numerical models and uh, try to uh, do numerical simulations about how nature works. So what exactly uh, do we do in these numerical simulations? First, there's a whole bunch of different physics. Is that we have a buoyant and plume, we have air-sea interactions, we have ocean mixing, uh, current evection. And all these different physical processes, we're able to write mathematical equations, uh, based, usually based on conservation laws. Shown here is a set of uh, equations known as the Navier-Stokes equations. So these are mathematical equations. They're nonlinear, they're coupled, they're very difficult. No one's been able to uh, solve them in their entirety, which is good. It gives uh, us physical oceanographers a job security. And uh, what we need to do with this, since we can't solve it analytically with a uh, pencil and paper, is we need to write a computer code to solve these numerical, numerically. So we take the equations of motion, write a numerical version of them, a discrete version that we could run on a computer. So we need to know, to predict the future, you need to know the present. So at time equals zero, we need to know what the ocean currents are. We need to know what the initial location of the oil is. Uh, there's some examples shown in the left of the slide. And we need to know what the winds are, the waves are. We could put a, uh, what I did in my code is I, I, I brought in the measured winds and put the effects of the winds and waves together at a value of 3% of the wind speed. Then we need to run this on a supercomputer, a large computer that's fast with many processors and do prediction. So this is analogous in the ocean what uh, they do in the atmosphere for numerical weather prediction on a daily basis. And it's important to add that the prediction of the winds from the atmospheric models are very important for driving the ocean currents. Now, how, how long can we predict the movement of oil for? Well, it depends where you are, what time of the year, but on the average, we could predict things for two to seven days. Why is that? Well, in a simple word, nonlinear fluid dynamics. Uh, this effect was known by Wielander in the 1950s, shown in the upper left-hand panel is a... Uh, picture in the, in the most upper panel of an eddy interacting with a strong current shown in all the pressure distributions. And in that flow, they put a checkerboard uh, pattern of black and white uh, particles, and they looked at what happens to the particles. And if you notice, the evolution is right below the picture. There's uh, five snapshots in, increasing in time from left to right and then to the bottom row. And we can see by the fourth and fifth picture in particular, there are very long filamented um, parts of the uh, dyed uh, water particles being stretched out by the eddies like we've seen in the visible and SAR images of the oil. The other thing is if you concentrate on the black and white uh, two squares in the upper right-hand corner and look at how they move apart in time, you can see that places that were fairly close together over time spreads very quickly. 
Uh, shown in the upper right-hand panel is a prediction of what happens when you put particles in the Gulf Stream. Now, these particles were a few kilometers apart, and, and after one week of doing a numerical simulation, they're 300 kilometers apart. So very small differences in the initial location of the oil, small differences in the values of the currents and the winds produce very large differences in where the oil goes. This is due to nonlinear dynamics. Uh, there was a lot of theoretical work done uh, in the ocean, in the atmosphere, uh, starting with Wielander and then Lorenz's famous work in the 1960s. Uh, shown here is a butterfly uh, a tractor, and uh, he, sh he showed in numerical simulations that small uh, perturbations in atmospheric conditions cause large changes in atmospheric forecasts uh, far away from the location of initial uh, perturbation. And made a comment that you know you could, a butterfly could flap its wings uh, in one location and, and change the weather in another location. Uh, shown here are five estimates of simulated oil locations. Now, in this, in these uh, simulations uh, done by my colleagues at the Navy uh, Research Lab, we're very happy that they're part of CARTH, they're one of the world's best group of uh, uh, modelers. Uh, what they did for these simulations is in each simulation, the oil's coming out exactly the same, in the exact same location. They perturbed the ocean currents and the wind forcing by the amount of uncertainty, the amount of error we, ha we know about these estimates of the ocean currents and winds. And you can see, and I'm just showing you five of the ensembles that come out uh, in these simulations, you can see the distribution of oil is much different in the different simulations, even though everything is the same in these simulations except for small differences in ocean currents and uh, wind forcing. I'm going to show you a simulation now off the uh, Florida coast. This, this is where I live. Now, we had a small box, 10 miles by 10 miles, 100 square miles. Uh, time is running up. Uh, you can see the counter. We're on one day now. And you can see after one day that the oil that was uh, in this, either could be an oil spill. The other thing this could be is uncertainty in initial position and how that uncertainty in initial position grows due to uh, ocean dynamics for search and rescue uh, applications. And let me just stress, this is a very simplified uh, flow. This is not the realistic Florida current, but a simplified uh, version of it just to uh, show uh, the effects of uh, dispersion on oil. So we can see that after three days, uh, that a patch that was normally 100 square miles has evolved into a patch that's now 10,000 square miles. So if you're looking for somebody uh, that's lost at sea, uh, it becomes very difficult uh, to find them after 70, 72 hours, and that's the normal cutoff for U.S. Coast Guard search and rescue. So let me just say that the transport and dispersion of oil is governed by nonlinear processes. Small changes in the ocean currents of wind used for prediction leads to significant changes in the forecast of oil trajectories. So we must have accurate ocean current and wind information. And the best way to get accurate uh, information is to go out and measure things. Now, there's two different viewpoints for observing, analyzing, and modeling fluids. One is the Eulerian viewpoint that's fixed in space. So you put an a, a instrument at a fixed location, like a current meter, and it measures velocity. Now, another approach is Lagrangian, which is following a tagged fluid parcel. So somehow we tag a, a fluid parcel either with dye or with some type of drifter, and we follow it in time. The Eulerian uh, viewpoint is named after Euler, a Swiss mathematician, and Lagrangian is named after Lagrange, a very famous mathematician. Okay, so here's an example of an Eulerian method, uh, current meters uh, fixed to the sea bottom. Uh, the current meters are shown uh, uh, with uh, weather, vane, weather vane looking uh, devices to help it line up with the flow, it helps give it direction, and then in these current meters there's little cups that are very efficient at catching the water flow, and they spin around, and the amount of spins is related to the amount of flow. They're anchored by heavy anchors. Uh, here at the uh, University of Miami, we use uh, used railroad uh, wheels. And uh, we have an acoustic release. So you, put, you set these out in the ocean. Uh, you come back a year later, six months later, two years later, you send down a 17 kilohertz signal. The acoustic release will hopefully release your instrument. On the top uh, part of this instrument, you can see a, 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 a circle. And that is to uh, represent a positive buoyancy uh, spheres that are put on these current meters, one to keep the current meter taut in the water column so it stays at the depth you want, but once you release the uh, anchor uh, weight, uh, those glass spheres, which are in plastic hard hats, bring this instrument uh, up to the surface. 
Uh, the other way is Lagrangian, following a tag fluid parcel, shown as one of the first Lagrangian uh, instruments from the RV Challenger that went around the world measuring uh, biogeochemical physical properties of the ocean in the uh, later part of the 19th century. And they were able to measure currents by visually uh, tracking this, which lead, actually leads to large error. Uh, through the history of oceanography, we've used a lot of inexpensive uh, drifters. Uh, Richardson and Stommel did a, a famous experiment looking at ocean uh, dispersion with parsnip. Uh, we used IBM cards for all you old timers out there. Remember programming in the old days? We weren't allowed to touch a computer. We had to give it uh, instructions by IBM cards. And so there's a lot of IBM cards relying around labs, and they turned out to be pretty good followers of water. Of course, the old message in a bottle, uh, people have marked coconuts, and in the upper top right panel showing a dye experiment with a minograph uh, paper going out, and, and they'll be taking aerial uh, photographs of that dye and then going on later measuring concentrations of it to determine how uh, the dye moves around. Now, we also have natural drifters uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, off the east coast of the United States, most of the northwest Atlantic, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, is sargassum weed. Sargassum weed is very important uh, because it is the uh, nursery for a lot of the large pelagic fish in the northwest Atlantic. In the image on the lower right, you can see a lot of the bait fish uh, that's attracted. Sargassum forms these masses we can see in the uh, lower left-hand corner uh, that line up with the convergence zone. So one of the big uh, fears during the oil spill is we know that the oil will end up in these convergence zones. The sargassum is in these convergence zones, so we expect to see very large uh, concentrations of oil in areas that are uh, extremely important. Uh, for the health of the uh, fisheries, and the long-term consequences of that uh, will take a few years to figure out. So let's mention some other uh, ways people have measured uh, circulation. One is the old message in the bottle. Here they uh, put a lot of uh, bottles out at Riley's Hump. It turns out to be a spawning site uh, for mutton snapper, and they recovered uh, the uh, bottles in different locations up and down the Florida Key, Day County, Broward, uh, Broward County, and uh, Palm Beach. Uh, showing that the mutton snapper spawn in this area and then help populate the Florida reef uh, system. Uh, drift cards were used a lot. There was a major project in the Gulf of Mexico in the late 1950s where they put drift cards out, a lot of them along the uh, West Florida Shelf to uh, measure the circulation. And we're still getting some drift cards back. A couple years ago, I received a drift card uh, from Fort Pierce. We also had one uh, drift card that was found off the north coast of Brazil and none of us could figure out how it ever got there. Sometimes, there may be uh, an oceanographic explanation, but we haven't been able to uh, figure it out. We think somebody may have picked up a drift card and, and released it down there later on. Uh, through time, we've, there's been some interesting items that have been lost in the ocean that uh, people like Kurt Ebsenmeyer have used to, to track ocean currents. Uh, there was the great Nike uh, sneaker accident in uh, May of 90, uh, where the sneakers then started turning up a year or two later along the west coast of the United States and Hawaii. And then the rubber ducky, very famous uh, accident in January 92, fairly close to the other accident scene, uh, the real strong winds in that area. And one of the things they noticed is these duckies uh, ended up in the uh, uh, Arctic Circle area, and they actually came around uh, Greenland and uh, came down uh, uh, the, the northeast uh, in northwest, excuse me, northwest part of the Atlantic. And 11 years later, they actually found ducks uh, making landfall in the, uh, Scotland and Maine. Now. With any data set, sometimes you get some anomalies, and they're really interesting, and they actually take a lot of our time to analyze. They found some ducks uh, uh, in 92, late 92, that there's no way those ducks could have gotten from the accident site uh, to those locations in 92. So they were ducks probably lost uh, by some other means. Uh, one of the workhorses of measuring uh, near-surface ocean currents is the Davis uh, co-drifter. Um, code stands for California Ocean Dynamics Experiment, was the first use of, of, of these drifters. Um, and shown here are these drifters. Uh, they have uh, fabric used for veins to help uh, um, with their water uh, following capability. Uh, in this case, this drifter is shown with an antenna. It was transmitting either to land edge stations or uh, plane. Uh, planes were flying over to receive the signal. Uh, now we uh, pretty much uh, transmit uh, to different uh, satellites, either the Argo satellites on the NOAA system or one of the uh, Iridium satellites or GPS-based uh, uh, satellites like the SPOT uh, system. Also shown on these drifters are uh, uh, four pieces of styrofoam tied to rope to the drifters. Uh, what they do is help keep the drifters in the water um, during large 
uh, wave events. And this particular drifter is what our Karth used uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, other drifters uh, the, uh, are shown here. Uh, the middle panel on the bottom is an example of one of the code uh, uh, type of drifters that has been uh, instrumented with uh, different instruments. Uh, on, and the whole set of three panels in the top are the uh, workhorse of near surface uh, drifter measurements uh, being put out by AOML and other countries from around the world. Uh, they consist of a holy sock uh, that has a, a size, depending on either the mini or the, the maximum on the order of 5 to 20 meters. They drove for depths of usually on the order of 10 to 15 meters, though people have done experiments with these drifters, drove at deeper depths like 50 to 100 meters. And the ball that you see in the upper left-hand panel and in the surface in the middle one uh, contains electronics where it transmits to the Argo satellite uh, system. So the Argo satellite system, uh, we're able to tell where that drifter is at a particular time. And by putting all the drifter positions with time, you use a little calculus, calculate some derivatives. The position is velocity. Uh, we get the velocities. Um, these drifters also have other instruments. Uh, most of them have sea surface temperature uh, measurements uh, on them, other, which has helped to use to calibrate the sea surface temperature uh, measurements from satellites. Uh, some of them uh, have sensors on there to measure salinity, and some of them have come, uh, measure atmospheric pressure, and they also have a really interesting way to, to measure wind velocity uh, with a vane given direction and actually a sound sensor measuring the ambient ocean noise, which is a strong function of wind speed. Now, shown in the bottom right hand uh, panel is a, a spider looking type of drifter uh, that's being developed, uh, that has been developed in Europe, and that drifter uh, is specially designed to try to uh, track oil movement. So uh, this drifter uh, moves like oil much more so uh, than any of the other drifters uh, shown in this picture. Uh, so let me show you one of the first uh, uh, set of data that came from the near surface drifters. Here's uh, a drifter that was put in, in 1977, uh, year day 105, near a longitude of 70 west, a latitude of 36 north. And you can see that this drifter has significant rotary motion. This was ring bob. Uh, and this is one of these eddies. This is a large Gulf Stream eddy known as a Gulf Stream ring. In this case, it was a cold core ring. And we can see it had very significant rotary motion. Uh, that's why we see all the looping. And the fact that there's a mean background flow, so this drifter is spinning around in the eddy. And as it's spinning, it's being pushed by the mean background flow. And that's why we get looping. And there are places where there's some cusp-like motion, and those are the places where the rotational speed of the eddy is equal to the translational speed of the background uh, currents. So let me show you some more trajectory. This is one of my favorite ones, launched uh, in Florida Bay on just inshore of the Keys. And we can see that this drifter uh, trajectory, um, we, you can see the dates. So the places where the, the dates are fairly far apart, the velocity is great. Where the dots are close together, the velocity is weak. So we can see as this drifter moves up the Florida coast, it's in the uh, Florida Straits, uh, offshore of the Carolinas, it's deflected a little bit offshore by a topographic feature known as the Charleston bump. Uh, we get a little uh, action in the slope water. It slows down, then it gets caught in the Gulf Stream and maps out Gulf Stream meanders, both the troughs and the crest, before getting then entrained into the slower subtropical gyre circulation that also is uh, has significant eddy uh, variability. The speeds in the gyre are on the order of 10 to 20 centimeters a second, and the speeds of the Gulf Stream is over 200 centimeters a second. So there's an order of magnitude of difference in speeds from the interior of the ocean as compared to the west, strong western boundary currents. Here's another beautiful drifter launched off of Iceland. This makes two counterclockwise loops around the subpolar gyre. And it's amazing uh, this drifter did this. And you can see how closely uh, the, the paths follow year after year. Shown in the dotted line is a, a particular bottom uh, contour. And one of the things you notice, even for a drifter who's floating at the surface on the order of 10 meters below the surface, there's strong topographic control in an ocean that's four to 5,000 meters deep in that location. Well, one of the things we do with the drifters, we take all the speeds, uh, we put them together. And what this shows out in black are speeds greater than a meter a second, you know, on the order of two miles an hour. And what we can see in this picture is the Yucatan current in the lowermost left feeding into the loop current, feeding into the Florida current. 
feeding into the Gulf Stream system, and then once we start getting uh, east of 50 degrees, the Gulf Stream system uh, starts uh, bifurcating. We could take all the data, we could plot the, uh, how much data we have to know where we could believe it and where we need to put more data. We could look at the energy level of the surface ocean and we could look at the speed. And one of the things you, you learn from this is that we have the strongest and most energetic flows along the western boundary currents. That's to do with the fact that the Coriolis uh, rotation changes with latitude. We also have very strong flow in the equatorial uh, region driven by the trade winds and very strong uh, flow in the Antarctic circumpolar current region due to the strong winds in that particular uh, area. So we're going to play a video here. There may be a little lag between the audio and the uh, picture, but bear with us. So this is like a video. Bob. Bob is doing well. Very well indeed. That's because he's helping the planet with his specially designed body. Bob drifts with ocean currents and communicates his position and speed back to scientists on shore. Today, Bob is in the Gulf of Mexico. Sometimes, if the conditions are right, he can get stuck in what is known as the loop current. In the loop current, Bob meets larval lobsters from Mexico. The currents may take them through the Straits of Florida towards the reefs of Florida and the Caribbean, where they can grow into legal-sized delicacies. If there's a hurricane, Bob doesn't evacuate. He stays and measures valuable data about the violent surface currents. Thanks, Bob. Bob can help in all kinds of emergencies, including when a pollutant is released into the water. Bob drifts with the yucky stuff in the ocean currents and sends his data to be fed into computer models that help scientists predict his fate. Not only that, but if somebody gets lost at sea, who can help figure out where the ocean currents may take him? Bob can. To track Bob and his friends and to learn more about what he does, visit C-A-R-T-H-E dot org. Okay, so uh, as that cute little video introduced, uh, we, uh, the car group uh, designed uh, over and deployed over 300 drifters in really in about a week's uh, time, the largest drifter experiment ever done. Uh, at one time in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Some of the uh, drifters were tracked for as long as six months, and we collected over almost six million uh, data points. So here's one of our sampling patterns, an S-shaped pattern. The, the line moving quickly is, is the ship, and shown are clusters of drifters. So in this one S-shaped pattern, uh, we put out uh, 90 drifters and 30 clusters of three each. And you can see the initial uh, movement of the drifters most of them are going to the uh, south and they're still staying fairly close together. Shown here is uh, a uh, video of the other drifter trajectories. There's different drifters uh, corresponding to different colors, showing you where the well site is. We concentrated the experiment around where the well site is. Uh, one of the things you see is significant rotary motion, some of it very small scale. That's due to a process called inertial oscillations. That's the free solution uh, to the uh, water movement. We also see larger oscillations uh, associated uh, with the eddies. So some of these, uh, most of the drifters, you can see left the area where we deploy them. Some of the drifters, uh, like especially the ones going to the southeast right now, really quickly were caught in very strong circulation uh, features. So from all these drifters, we're able to help uh, improve the estimates of ocean velocity. We also looked at how water disperses and looked at uh, dispersion statistics and published a number of papers of those and, and more are coming out. I'm going to uh, continue the uh, animation of this. Now, one of the things we're going to see coming up, uh, coming uh, close right now, is a track of Hurricane Isaac that went through our drifter array in August of uh, 2012. And one of the things you notice is the size of the circles increased because the, the water velocity increased greatly due uh, to the hurricane. The inertial oscillations got larger. And the other thing you notice is now there's a bunch of yellow dots on the Mississippi Delta. Uh, the drifters were um, uh, blown on the shore by the hurricane. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the problem uh, with the fact that there's oil still in the marshes when, when you're going to have these very strong atmospheric and oceanic 
uh, events because there is a, a strong storm surge associated with the hurricane that will take this oil and move it further back uh, into the ecosystem. Here's another uh, simulation of this hurricane. Uh, it's a very important event. Uh, so we uh, did a lot of simulations of it. And uh, also shown in this particular one is the sea surface height. And you can see that near the coast, uh, the waves are over, uh, the significant wave height is over 25 feet, which again will have a significant impact on any oil along uh, the coastline. And also you see in the simulation all the drifters ending up back on the coast. Here's a very interesting uh, animation showing why it's difficult to predict oil movement. So there's three drifters here, but you're only seeing two, but now you're finally seeing the third. So these three drifters were launched initially 100 meters apart. Um, there's a time uh, going, you see Tuesday the 31st, Wednesday, we're on day number 10. So on day number 10, one drifter is all by itself. The other two drifters actually came back together, and it looks like the one drifter by himself is going to win the race uh, to get the furthest away from its launch location after the first, uh, we're now up to 20 days. It got caught in a significant uh, dynamical feature. You see how quickly it moved. But now it got kicked out of the dynamical feature and slowed up. And now like the horse coming out of the back stretch, we have this other drifter totally past it as it actually ended up staying in that strong dynamical feature. So after uh, 30 days, three drifters that were just 100 meters apart have now moved to distances uh, on the order of two, 300 kilometers apart. So this shows the difficulty in predicting uh, the movement of oil. Uh, we also did experiments along the uh, coast. Uh, actually, what happened there? That went a little too quick. In December of 2013, tracked drifters near the beach. We tracked them with drones, helicopters, dives, using boats and jet skis. It was a pretty fun experiment. I wish I was up there, but I couldn't make it. Uh, shown here are the crew putting out uh, some of the drifters. These drifters that were a different design. Uh, they uh, were designed so they actually stay in the surf. As you can imagine, uh, when waves break, they would throw the plastic drifters up in the air and onto the beach. Uh, these drifters had a tendency to stay more in the water. Uh, shown in the bottom right is some of the die release uh, experiments. And one of the things you, you notice uh, in the die release experiment, the bright colors that are been funneled into a fairly narrow area and going offshore. Uh, this is a prime example of a rip current. And what this die shows is what you have all uh, hear about. If you get caught in a rip current, the rip current will have a tendency to be parallel to the beach. So you would um, uh, swim with that rip current. And then if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you can start seeing some of that rip, uh, some of that die is coming back uh, inshore. Uh, and a part of this experiment was to learn more about rip currents uh, since they do uh, cause a number of drowning uh, fatalities uh, every year. Um, we've seen some of the classic ideas of what rip current systems look like, which are counter-rotating uh, rotary flows right next to the coast. But we've also uh, seen uh, some of these rotary flows not being counter-rotating but being next to each other with the same sense of rotation. Uh, which really hasn't been described too much in the literature. So here's an example of one uh, launch of drifters off uh, Desden. We can see that they initially start going offshore, and then they start approaching uh, the beach at a later time. So I'm going to show you now an animation of all the drifter uh, launch. Uh, there's a one uh, vector that you can see around 30.1 north, 87.6 west. That's the wind speed. And you will notice the, the direction of the wind speed uh, forces the direction of the uh, drifters, which way they go a lot. So right now the wind's blowing in. Most of the drifters launched are going in. Now finally we got the wind blowing offshore a little bit. Now there's one fast uh, trajectory in here. That's, uh, there's a, a drifter on the boat, so we kept uh, track of the boat. Um, so there's one real fast moving back and forth, and that's the boat. So now you can see a significant offshore breeze, and the, and the drifters uh, do uh, venture far out of the, uh, off the coast. So we launched them near the beach. They're hitting depths of uh, uh, 50 meters. Now the wind changed direction. The drifters headed back towards shore. The wind changes direction again. The drifters head offshore. So this is a really neat animation showing the effect of uh, wind speed on our drifter uh, trajectories, that the drifters in the coastal areas, their uh, motion is prim primarily determined uh, by the winds. Uh, so it's important to do forecast the ocean currents to have really good uh, forecast of the wind speed. Uh, I hate to say, given this uh, particular political climate, a, a lot of the uh, buoys out in the northern Gulf of Mexico along the east and west coast of the United States are not being maintained, are not being replaced. New ones are not going in. 
so the wind uh, velocity is near the coast. The data sets are actually getting poorer when they should be getting better because we have much better uh, technology. Talk to you, Congressman. Anyway, here's a uh, spaghetti plot. We call it spaghetti plot where we just put the entire, all the trajectories uh, together on uh, one plot. And so the one thing that this uh, plot shows you that there was a significant amount of exchange of water between the coast and the deep water. If you remember the other trajectories that we launched in the deeper water, they made it to the coast. So in this area of the northern Gulf of Mexico, there is significant exchange between the coastal and deeper ocean uh, waters. So it's 5 o'clock. Let me start wrapping this up in saying that real-time currents are needed for accurate prediction of oil movements. Measuring ocean currents is expensive. Those drifters are on the order of four or $500 a piece with the uh, contract that was required to uh, track them. And, and we were tracking them at very high resolution at every 5 to 15 minutes uh, in time. Current meters are expensive. Ship time is expensive, twenty to $30,000 uh, a day. One of the things we know from the last 30, 40 years of ocean expo exploration, and, we're, and we keep seeing it and learning that it's even more important than we first realized, is the fact that these energetic ocean areas are very, ocean areas are very important for transporting dispersing oils. Uh, this experiment, uh, the, the GLAD experiment, the Grand Lagrangian uh, deployment, where we deployed over 300 drifters in the northern Gulf of Mexico, one of the things we realized from that is that the small scale, sub mesoscale motion is, o is also extremely important. And we, we really need to come up with good ideas about how we're going to be able to measure that component of the velocity field because it is important for dispersing oil. Um, we know that small errors in observations lead to large errors in predicting where the oil goes, and because of these errors in nonlinear uh, dynamic, constrains actu accurate prediction limits to be about two to seven days. In some of the coastal areas close to the coast, the prediction limit is probably about two days. In strong circulation features like the loop current, loop current errors, uh, eddies, the uh, prediction limit is about two to seven days. So I'm going to stop uh, here. I'll answer your questions, and I'd like to thank you for your time. Okay, well, thank you very much, Arthur. Um, like I said, everybody who's on, this is your chance to use our chat box to type in any questions that you have that you'd like to have answered. We'll give everybody a minute or two to think about their questions and get them typed in. So they said, um, as an educator, they're hoping to share some of this with their students. Is there any way they can access some of these animations or drifter movement to show students? Um, I will say we are recording this, so the recording will be up on our website. But do you have any other any other ideas, Arthur? Uh, on the Carth.org uh, uh, website, there, there you can look up uh, most of these animations. We, we do have the videos online. Okay, well, uh, I'll try to I'll add that as a resource to uh, your your webinar page. Okay, good. And also, um, I have an educational website I'm building on surface currents. Uh, just the simplest way to find it is just type ocean surface cu currents into Google and uh, go to the Miami site, and you can learn a lot more about the loop current and the Florida current on the ocean current website. And we also, um, you know, since there, uh, there are some nice companies out there that will allow you to uh, put stuff online, we have something on Vimeo. B-I-M-E-O dot com slash cost. You could also find some of our videos. Thank you, Laura. Okay, well, I will make sure to go find those as well and put them up um, on our website along with this presentation. Um, someone's asking, is there a site that their students can go to to learn how to build drifters? Oh, I, that's a good question. Do, do we have anything about building drifters? Yeah. 
they yes. should just contact me. We're working on a lesson plan, but it's not quite finished yet. Uh, probably the best thing to do is to get in touch with Laura Bracken. You could give people uh, her email. Uh, we're working on a lesson plan uh, for that. We've uh, previously had some schools engaged, like Mass Academy, in building drifters. And uh, some of the uh, drifters we've launched in our experiments were uh, put together by high school students. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone's asked, if the equations behind the numerical models can't be solved by humans, how are computers programmed to do so? Well, they, they can't be solved analytically by any analytic method. There's no way you could come up with a theory to fully solve these equations. But there is a way to write the equations in a numerical form where the equations are solved iteratively. So it solves one part and sends that to another part, which sends it to another part, which sends it back. And there's a lot of information. It requires a tremendous amount of calculations. So yes, we could conceivably do those hand, uh, those calculations by hand and come up with an answer, uh, but it's not uh, uh, practical or feasible. Um, the other thing is people make mistakes. Um, once you have the computer program, it's not going to make any mistakes. Uh, a Richardson, who a uh, British scientist, actually tried uh, to do weather forecasting around the time of World War II uh, in England using a, a room full of people. And one of the things uh, they found is that, you know, the little mistakes people uh, made in their computations because of non uh caused major problems in the solution. I hope that answers your question. If, if not, re-ask it, please. Um, someone's asking, can these models be used for anything other than oil transport? Oh, yes. Uh, we, we're using them to predict the state of the ocean. So the atmospheric models, they tell you um, what the wind, uh, air temperatures are, and whether it's going to rain and, or not. Ocean models uh, tell you the water velocity, the temperature of the water, and the amount of salts in the water. It tells us the density distribution, uh, the pressure uh, distributions. They're used by the U.S. Navy uh, for military uh, reasons. Uh, they're used uh, by scientists uh, in experiments to have an idea of the flow conditions. So there are a lot of uses for these models besides predicting uh, where oil goes. The U.S. Coast Guard uses uh, models uh, to predict. Um, they're not as elaborate as these full-blown models, but they use parameterized simpler models, but they run it a lot with good data to predict where people are uh, um, going in search and rescue operations. Uh, the Stony Brook School in Long Island, New York, asked um, if there were any other websites or resources to help their students build some drifters. So um, you, noted, you noted that there's a lesson plan possibly coming out through CARS, but do you know of any other sites or resources they could use? I'll be honest. Um, I know Noah does. I can send the website. Uh, Noah uh, has a website, and uh, Laura will send you a link uh, to that. Perfect. And just so everyone knows, this Laura that we're talking about used to be a RC, uh, Regional Coordinator for NOSB, so she knows the students really well. She'll make sure you get some good information. Yeah, we're lucky enough to have her working for outreach for cost now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Anyone have any other questions? Feel free to type them in. Well, I'll ask the question. Our last presenter made a comment that um, when there are oil spills or these issues in the Gulf of Mexico, um, in a sense it's not good, but it's better than other regions because you can mobilize so quickly. How quickly were you able to start working on these models um, when the BP oil blowout hit? Um, well, there was a, Noah immediately started uh, working on this. Um, the people in academia it took a few days uh, to get spun up. Uh, one reason is we didn't have funding to do that particular work at that time, and you know most of us are overwhelmed uh, with what we have. But on the side, uh, quite a number of oceanographers. It took us about a week uh, to spin everything up. Uh, we had models running uh, already in the Gulf of Mexico, and we just had to come up with a, a way to put in the initial 
uh, location of the oil into the models. Uh, so we're, we were using NOAA's best estimates, uh, estimates that were coming out of the University of South uh, Florida, estimates that Ross uh, was producing, and with those estimates, uh, we were um, digitizing that information using some software then to take the digitized information and produce a file of initial oil location. So we ha had to do all of that. And, uh, but now, uh, you know, we have stuff up and running. Okay, someone has asked if you're at all involved in the recent penalty determination for BP. Uh, not that I know of. Okay. <laughs> we have a, a few more minutes if anyone else has questions. Any other questions for our presenter? I guess I'll ask you one more question. Um, since a lot of these coaches are dealing with students who are looking into careers, did you start your career knowing you were going to be an oceanographer, or how did you get to where you are now? Oh, that's a, a great question. Um, well, when I was growing up, I really liked the ocean. I really liked fishing. Um, I happened to be good at math. I, I realized that early on. So when I was in high school, I went into the uh, guidance council. They gave me a big book. We didn't do anything online then. And in this big book, I, uh, it was about careers. And I, you know, looked up what careers, if you're into the ocean and mathematics, and it came out to be physical oceanography. So pretty much in high school, I knew I was going to become a physical oceanographer. I went to Stockton College. I studied both marine science and math. And then I went to the University of Rhode Island. I was very lucky there to be a student of uh, Tom Rossby, who is uh, one of the pioneers in using Lagrangian instruments uh, to measure ocean currents and, you know, at that point, working with a, a you know, a tremendous mentor like Tom Rossby uh, really uh, piqued my interest and kept my interest in uh, physical oceanography. And then after that, I decided, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at data. I needed to do something different, so I went up to Harvard uh, University to work with Alan Robison and to do numerical model and, and how to look at the problem, how to put ocean data into ocean models. Because that was a number of decades ago, and, and uh, ocean prediction was a fairly uh, new field uh, uh, back then. So I was at Harvard for a while, and then I uh, came to the University of Miami. The weather's better here. The fishing's much better here. And uh, I ended up working with the remote sensing group, uh, working with uh, sea surface uh, temperature images. Uh, so, yeah, I've been into the ocean and looking at how to model and predict the ocean for a long time. Great. Thanks. Okay, well, it doesn't look like uh, we have any other questions just coming in. Just a few comments to say thank you, as they really enjoyed the presentation. You're welcome. So, Again, thanks to all your teachers. You have a tough job. I've been in a, you know, a few schools in outreach, and I, I really appreciate what you do. I have a hard enough time giving three lectures in a row. I, you know, you're all giving uh, much more than that every day, so thank you. Well, so everyone knows, we will have the recording of this webinar posted up on our website. Just go to www.nosb.org. It will be up tomorrow morning, and we will try to get as many of these other resources that they've been talking about, um, CARS, Ocean Surface Currents at Miami, the Vimeo, and some of these lesson plans from CARS. We'll try to get those up on the website as soon as possible as well. Um, we will also be posting these webinars on our YouTube site shortly. So. Uh, you can just search YouTube um, if you need to find them. And as I said earlier, please share these recordings with other educators and obviously with your students and NOSB teams. Our next webinar will be Tuesday, January 27th. Dr. Joseph Montoya from Georgia Institute of Technology is going to be speaking about the ecosystem impacts of oil. So we've done chemistry, physical oceanography, now we're getting sort of into the, the biology and ecosystem impacts. Um, and we will be 
advertising this webinar just like we have been uh, for the past three or two. So look for an email from us later this week uh, with all the information that you need. Again, please share that with anyone who might be interested. Um, and thank you for attending the webinar. We're really glad you could join us today. And Arthur, thank you very much for presenting. I think everyone really enjoyed this, and this is something that's very different um, from what we've had presentations done in the past. So thank you. You're welcome. It was, it was fun. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.